so today's class is, again, the, the, we're, we're continuing with the more advanced topics on execution. So today's class, we're going to talk about vectorized execution. So this is now looking out how to parallelize on a single core, whereas in the previous lectures, we've been parallelizing across, across multiple cores. So this is, I, in my opinion, I consider this one of the, the advanced topics, uh, in, the most advanced topics in the class, because the SIMD stuff is sort of, at a high level, is, is sort of easy to understand, but then seeing how you actually apply it to relational operators in our database system uh, can be tricky. So for this, we'll start off with the, the, some, again, some background information about uh, what vectorization looks like, what hardware looks like, and then we'll get into the, the details of the, of the, the algorithms that, that you guys read about in the paper from Columbia. So in my opinion, this, this paper is a really good instructional guide on how to build vectorized algorithms for a database management system. But the spoiler will be, and we'll see this as we go along, is that uh, it doesn't actually work. Um, it doesn't work for two reasons. Uh, one of them we've already we've talked about before, and then one of them will come up as we go along today. And then the paper you'll read from on Monday's class, actually today's what? Today's Wednesday. On Monday's class is, uh, is our sort of implementation of a vectorized database system. Um, so it's Prashant's work on showing how we can actually still do some of the things that the Columbia guys talk about um, even though we, there is that restriction that these guys uh, uh, just ignore. All right, so the high-level idea of what we're doing here today is that we want to vectorize our, our algorithms in our database system. So what does that mean? So the, the high-level idea of what we want to do is that we want to take an algorithm to do something in our system that would normally be implemented as, a, uh, as, a, as performing single operations at a time on a single data item, and then we want to generate a vectorized version that can do multiple oper or sorry, one operation on multiple pieces of data at the same time, right? And again, this is different than what we, we talked about before, right? So before we talked about how to do parallel joins, or we talked about how to do uh, uh, concurrency control or logging in parallel, all those techniques were about how do you take an algorithm or a component in the database system and scaled out horizontally across multiple cores and get, get parallelism that way. Now what we're talking about here is we're talking about taking a single core that could still be running in one of those parallel you know, uh, joint algorithms. We're taking a single core and showing how do we get parallelism within that, the, the, within that single execution thread. So the reason why this matters is that the speed up is, that we get from vectorization is actually multiplicative to the speed up you get from multi-threading. Right? So let's say that we have some algorithm, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, it's some algorithm that we can then we can parallelize to run concurrently on 32 cores. So now at, at each of these cores, if we have a four-wide sim, four SIMD register, meaning we can process four data items within a single SIMD instruction, then we'll get a 4x improvement. So we get a 32x improvement for the, the, the multi-threading, and then for each thread, you get a 4x improvement. So our total speed up here is 128x, which is an order of magnitude. Which this, is, this is quite significant. You don't see this very often in, in algorithms or in systems. So to get this potential speed up is, is massive, and this is why we want to do vectorization. Now, of course, obviously, we saw this when we talked about joins. Right? There's often times where the, the threads may have to, to synchronize or you have to write things into a shared buffer. Right? So we're not always going to get you know, 4x improvement, even though we have, uh, you know, we could process four things at a time in our SIMD registers. Right? This is sort of the upper bound of what, what we could achieve. Right? In practice, it's, it's going to be much, much lower, because it's not like every single instruction we're going to execute can be vectorized. But it is, it is something that can, can help a lot of things. So we talked about a little bit of this, uh, I think, uh, a few classes ago, when, or actually, Last class, when we talked about uh, just as an introduction to SIMD, we'll go into SIMD more detail. But for our discussion here today, I want to go into a bit more detail of what uh, sort of modern CPUs look like and how we can design algorithms that can take advantage of what these, this, these CPUs, uh, you know, how they actually execute instructions. And we want to design our vectorized versions of our algorithms so that we avoid some of the pitfalls and performance problems you can have if you don't use the hardware correctly. So there's essentially two classes of CPUs that, that, that you can have. 
So the first is what we most think of when we think of a, a CPU, like an Intel Xeon or AMD Ryzen, right? And these, these CPUs are characterized by having a small number of high-powered cores. So high power meaning that they have a more complex instruction set. They can do they can do more complex things than you know maybe what like uh, what your you know your 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 cell phone processor can do. Um, and they, they obviously also use use more energy. So this is most emblematic of like the latest version of the Intel Xeons. These we consider these, these one of these high power multi core CPUs. So the Sky Lake is I think the previous generation. The KB Lake is the current one. Um, the paper I think they, they're running on Hoswell. That's a few generations back, but it's the same same class of CPUs. So the, the key distinguishing characteristic about these type of CPUs is that they're going to be massively scalar and try to support uh, really aggressive out-of-order out of execution. So everyone should have probably basically taken some basic you know, architecture course at some point. But as, as a refresher, super scalar just means that the CPU can execute multiple instructions from its, from its pipeline within the same clock cycle. And the out-of-order part means that it doesn't have to actually execute those instructions in its pipeline in the same way that they were uh, issued when you actually run, run your application. Right? And the idea here is that the CPU wants to go figure out, you know, once we do something at all times, so rather than executing things in order, you know, one instruction after another, if it knows some instruction is going to get blocked because of a cache miss or because it has to go out to memory to get something, uh, it can maybe peek ahead, execute some other instructions, and hopefully don't depend on the output of the instruction you're stalled on, and then they can execute in parallel at the same time, and that way at the end you end up with the same uh, correct result or correct answer. It's just you've you've actually you know you're actually utilizing the CPU more because you can jump ahead and, and execute things that you you normally would have to wait for something in front of it. So to make this out of order uh, stuff actually work, is that they have to have this, these extra me extra mechanisms in the system uh, or on the CPU that can figure out the dependency between instructions. So that it knows that again, if something relies on the output of something else, you don't want to you don't want to preemptively execute it, right? You have to wait for the 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 one that you depend on to finish up first, right? And there's the other additional things that, that these these uh, these high powered CPUs can do uh, with trying to figure out you know what 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 branch you're going to go down in, in your instruction, like if you have an if clause, you know whether you're going to go down execute something inside of it or whether jump around it. Right? And they want to do this because they, they, again, they're, they're trying to jump ahead and execute things before you actually may, maybe need them in hopes that you are going to need them. And so by the time you actually get to the point where you would normally execute them, the result's already done. Right? And then if you mispredict on the branch, you have to again, you know, undo all your changes and go execute things back uh, sequentially. This is why people always say if you have you know, in, a, in a tight loop, if you have an if branch or you make a function call that jumps to another location in, in the address space, this this becomes slow because this slows down your 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 program because the the CPUs are trying to do all this out of out of order stuff. And so we'll see this later on when, when we design our vectorized algorithms of how uh, you know how how design algorithms in such a way that uh, we can be mindful of this and avoid uh, these performance problems. So the other class of CPUs that were discussed in the paper are these these many integrated cores or MIX. Um, so these are uh, these are CPUs where you have a larger number of low power cores. So you have more cores than you would have in like a Xeon. So the Xeon, I think maybe the latest one, you get like 20 cores on a single CPU or 24. I forget the exact number. Um, these mix, they're talking about like 72 or 64 cores on a single CPU. Um, so these guys are going to be each core is going to use less power and take less uh, physical space on the actual socket than the high-powered cores in the, on the previous slide. Um, but in order to actually make them useful, uh, they're going to expand their instruction set to include new uh, SIMD operations. Because this is going to be important to do the kind of uh, processing that you may actually want to have a lot of cores on. So the paper, that the, 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 the processor that they target in the paper is this Intel Xeon Phi. You can also more or less think of this as, as also like a GPU, right? But the difference between a GPU and an Intel Xeon Phi is like this thing is actually can run x86 uh, 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 assembly code or instructions. So you could compile your program on a Xeon and then have it actually run on without making very many changes on the, on, 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 uh, the Intel Xeon Phi. 
So one thing that is, uh, I want to say up front about this paper, we'll, we'll cover this as we go along, but the paper talks about how the, their version of the Xeon Phi was non-superscalar and only supported in-order in execution. This is because when the paper was written in 2015, they were using the first version of the Xeon Phi, which was, have it, has its cores based on the, the P54, uh, P54C uh, instruction set or microarchitecture, which is the same thing as the, like the Pentium 4 from like the 1990s. So the, this is how things were up until 2016. The latest version of Xeon Phi, so if you ever Google to see what Xeon Phi actually, you know, what its microarchitecture looks like, it is now super scalar and supports out of order execution like, like the regular Xeon. So in the paper, they, they have the older version and the newer versions looks more like the Xeon. And they talk about how because they can do out of order execution on this, they get like a 3x improvement over what the old one, the old one could do. Right, so the, the cores on the, the Knight's Landing one is, is equivalent to like a Intel Atom processor now, right? Again, it's not as full powered as the, the Xeon, uh, but they're gonna overcome those, those, that lower, uh, you know, lower clock rate less CPU cache and things like that by having expanded uh, support for SIMD. So if, you, if you've never seen what these, these Xeon Phi's look like, uh, you actually can get them in three different form factors. So the first way you can get it is actually like, almost like a GPU. Like you can get something that sits on the PCI Express bus, and then you still have a, a host CPU that, that issues commands or instructions down to this thing, and, and it crunches on that and, and send, you know, sends back the results to you. And for this, I think you have to, I, I think this has onboard memory that you can load things into, right? It, it can't read directly. It's not cache coherent with the, the memory up above on the, on the host CPU. But you can also get what are called self-boot self CPUs where this is actually the host itself. So you can get it as it's in like a regular Xeon that this will actually run your operating system and, and you know, be the control CPU for the entire system. So the two versions of it are ones that just sits in the socket and then another one that has this little thing that comes out called like it's a fabric connect. So you can basically do like RDMA or do fast memory uh, connections with other, other machines, right? Sort of like, you, you know, you don't have to go through a bus or anything, like it's streaming directly off of the CPU. Um, and think of these like as GPUs, but instead of being like the, you know, having a, thousands of cores that can do some really limited things, these are like almost like full-fledged Intel x86 cores, right? You just get a lot more of them. So I think the latest version of the Knight's Landing, you get, uh, I think, like 72 cores. Um, I'll have to bleep this because we can't put it on the video, but so again, that will get bleeped or cut. Okay. Um, so for, again, for this paper, the reason I bring this up is this paper is going to have non-superscalar in, in order of execution, and we'll see performance results that are uh, indicative of these characteristics. But the latest versions will look like uh, the regular Xeons. So we talked about SIMD a little bit last class. We'll go a little bit more detail now. Uh, the uh... okay. So uh, the the again, SIMD is a class of CPU instructions that is going to allow us to to execute vectorized operations. So we can take a single instruction, uh, multiple data items, and apply that operation on it at, all at once. Um, and pretty much all of the major uh, 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 chip vendors have their own version of this, right? So, so in AMD and Intel, right? AMD has the, the, their different names for their things, but for for Intel, they start off with MMX, and then the latest version is AVX 512, right? And the 512 means that it has 512-bit registers, which is what we're going to need to do uh, parallel store merge. PowerPC has this thing called Altavec, and then ARM has their own SIMD instructions called called Neon. So this is that same example we saw last time uh, where we want to do x plus y equals z. So we, we want to add two vectors together and write it out to a new vector. And the, the simplest way to implement this is just a simple for loop that iterates over every uh, element, assuming x and y and z are the same length, and uh, just adds them together and writes it out into this. So the SISD instruction, so single, single instruction, single data item, is just this taking this for loop literally and going through and taking every single uh, offset, the two vectors, adding them together, and then producing a uh, single output, right? Whereas in SIMD, what you can do is you can have, you can group together uh, four elements at the same time and write them into a single SIMD register. So in this case here, we're doing 128-bit SIMD registers, and assuming these are 32-bit integers, so we have four lanes that we can write in 
uh, you know, uh, four different numbers. So each sort of slot is called a lane in, in SIMD parlance. And then now with the single SIM, SIMD instruction, we can add up the elements uh, at the same lane offset across the two vectors and then, and then write it out. And then now we can again gather together the, the, the next four elements, put them to our register, and, and write it out as well. So uh, this will come up a little bit later on, but one of the things you can do with, with SIMD is actually you can have actually fine-grained control on actually where you write things in, in your cache or whether you can write to the cache or not. So as I'm adding these numbers together, right, I need to get it out of the SIMD register. I could either just put it into to a CPU cache if I need to process it again, or I can have the CPU actually just write it directly to memory by passing the cache entirely. Um, and I would want to do this if I, if I know I'm not going to go back and read, the, read these values again anytime soon. Can you guys close the door? Thanks. Um, and this, this is used for some things like, say you're doing a join and you know you're not going to, uh, you know, you, 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 you do your, your SIMD operation, you produce some output, and you know you're not going to go read, back, read that back again for a while because you have to process the rest of the, the data. So you can, you can tell it to when you write the things out of the register to go directly into memory, right? That's sort of the, the streaming operation. And you do this to avoid avoiding polluting the cache. Um, we'll see this. Uh, this will come up later in a, in a few of these other algorithms. But in the paper you guys read on, um, uh, on, on Monday, this is something you do at sort of the end of the pipeline breaker. So if, when you reach the end of the pipeline and you have your tuples and your vector, you don't want to pollute your cache, you just want to write it out to memory because you want to go down and process the next vector. <coughs> yes? Does direct to memory mean like without cache? His question is, does direct to memory mean without cache? Yes. So like there's a, there, the class of instructions are called streaming instructions. Actually, that's the next slide. So the streaming here doesn't mean like, you know, streaming like, like video or like streaming like a data system. It means that like I can, Instead of writing to the, the, the instead of writing to CPU cache, but then eventually that gets flushed out to, to memory when, when the CPU decides, I can tell the CPU directly write it to memory, to avoid the cache entirely. Right. So I I, th I, thought, I talked a little bit about this uh, last class where I said Intel first put out their MMX instructions in, in the, the 1990s, but they were pretty much uh, unusable from a database system perspective because they were difficult to use, and you had to put the the, the, the uh, you had to write an assembly. You couldn't, you didn't have these intrinsics to make it easier to write. So it wasn't really until the SSE stuff came out in 1999 of when this th these things actually became uh, something that we can apply to our database system and, and, and leverage. So the 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 first version of, of these SSE they had 128 bit SIMD registers, and we'll see in a few slides how they sort of over time they expanded the. Uh, the number of uh, the number of items you can store in your registers and do more operations on them, right? So the class of operations you can have for SIMD, the class of instructions, are sort of the standard things you would expect, like moving data in and out of registers, like doing loads and stores to get things from from your cache into your registers, um, then doing all the the additions, uh, subtraction, multiplication, all your ar arithmetic operators, and then your logical op instructions to do Boolean logic. Um, but the ones that are most interesting to us is doing the shuffle instructions, so allowing us to move data from one SIMD register to another directly without having to put things back in our CPU cache. All right, this is going to be really important because what we want to be able to do is we're going to load our things in our SIMD registers, and we're going to do all the operations we can just entirely in the SIMD registers because uh, then we don't have to transfer anything back to our caches, and it'll be really, really fast. So the shuffle operations are, are going to allow us to do this. And then we also have... Uh, additional instructions to do conversion, so how the CPU will represent things in you know, regular x86 versus the actual SIMD registers is slightly different, so they have, they have uh, uh, transformation operations or instructions. And then, as I talked about before, you, have, you can have cache control where you can decide uh, if you want to get things out of a SIMD register, do you put it in your CPU cache or do you put it in, into memory? Um, and, and this, depending on what algorithm we're doing in our database system, we, we may or may not want to do this. So I like this table because uh, it shows the history of Intel's development of the, the, the SIM, SIMD instructions. So this is from a uh, former director at Intel, uh, James Rendier, who was like the, one of the lead guys promoting and working on SIMD for, uh, at, at Intel for, for several years. So again, as I said, it started out in 1997 with MMX, but it was really limited to 64-bit registers. Um, and then in the SSE instructions, they added 128 
AVX came out in 2011 with 256 bits, and then we're at AVX 512, which just came out last year. Um, and you can see also too here, it's as they, they expand over time, the number of lanes they can support for uh, either single point or double point precision numbers, right? Where they've always they've always been able to support integers. So I'm often asked, uh, should we expect 1024 uh, SIMD registers? And as far as I can tell from from browsing the internet, it, it, it from what I can tell, there's there's no fundamental reason they couldn't do this. It just, you know, it takes more real estate on the chip, becomes more expensive to implement. Um, and from a database perspective, at this point, 512 is exactly what we need. So once we have this, we can we can start paralyzing more things. Yes. Why is the exact number? Because remember, so when we talked about parallel sort merge, we said that. Uh, you have 64-bit values, or 64-bit keys, and 64-bit pointers to tuples. So every single tuple that you want to join can be represented as uh, 128 bits. Okay. Right? And then we, when we did the Bitonic sort, sort network, the, the, that had to do four elements. So let's say if we have like 10, 24. You have 10, 24, you can just, you can, yeah. you can just sort more entirely in SIMD registers. The benefit well, you wouldn't be reduced. Like, like, without this, you can't do it. With 512, you can't. Like, with, without 512, you can't do it. With 512, we can. How much better it gets? Um, I mean, it, it's, it certainly would be improvement, but like, it's not a fundamental thing where like you can't have it at all. Whereas this thing gives us this, right? And actually, this is one of the big limitations of this paper. In the same thing we saw in the parallel sort merge paper, they assumed 32-bit uh, pointers to tuples and 32-bit keys. So all of their objects they're dealing with are always 64 bits. So that fits nicely when you have 256, right? Because you have four, four 64-bit uh, integers, whereas we we really need four 128-bit integers. That's 512. Okay, so now you may be thinking, all right, well, if we want to vectorize everything, uh, and we need we, we you know we want a lot of cores, we want a lot of these 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 we want wide wide registers, we put a lot of things in. Is this essentially what a GPU is? Right, GPU is, is going to be a lot of cores that we, that we can uh, process things in parallel and vectorize. So why not just use this instead of all this like, Intel SIMD stuff? Well, the answer is because the just like in, the, in the, the the Xeon 5 that sits on the PCI Express bus, it's not cache coherent with the, the in-memory database up above with the CPU. So that means any time we want to actually process anything, uh, and you run a query, say, in the GPU, we got to load and stream everything down to the GPU, crunch on it, and then stream everything back up, right? So that's why, as far as I know, there's none of the major commercial database systems actually support GPUs uh, as, you know, for native execution. But there has been, in the last two years, a, uh, a, there's been a new group of database systems that have come out that are actually designed to be specifically for, for GPU execution. So probably the most famous ones are MapD and Kinetica. Kinetica used to be called GPUDB. And so uh, these systems, as far as I know, they try to load as much of the database, or if not you know, the entire database, on the GPU and run all your queries down there. And again, because these, are, uh, these cores are much more simple than what you would get in an Intel you know, Xeon or Xeon Phi, they can't do sort of you know complex if statements and other things, right? So they can't have uh, you can't have an index on this. It'd be hard to maintain this. So in the case of Matt B, they just run everything as a sequential scan. So you load the entire database into GPU, and whatever your query is, it just scans the entire thing. And because it has so many cores, it can do this really really fast, right? Uh, Scream's another one, um, and there's a, there's a few others that are sort of working this area. So um, we'll see how these these new startups come along. But in general, again, the, the, the major commercial systems, none of the data systems, nobody actually uses GPUs. Now, one thing that actually may change this is that there's some new coprocessors that are coming out where the, uh, the coprocessor is, it can, is cache coherent with the CPU. So the most, the most easiest one to understand is the APU from AMD. It's essentially a GPU that sits on the socket uh, with, with the regular CPU cores and has access to all the main memory of the regular CPU. So, and it's, and again, it's cache coherent. So meaning like if, if a transaction updates some memory location, the, 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 the APU will see that. So in that case, you could push now query processing to the APU. Uh, there's another version, I think, that, this is out of date, but there's, uh, 
Intel had a prototype of that was sitting on the socket, but it, I think it got, it got discontinued. Um, but now you could do something like this, but as far as I know, nobody actually does. There's some papers on this area, but no one's actually looked at it. Yes? Did GPUs have some exclusive, uh, exclusive advantages? Why don't they just put, them, like, put the database on CPU that have like, the same cores, the same number of cores? Say it again. Yeah. Why not do what, sorry? Why don't they put the database on the CPUs that have the same number of cores? Or As a GPU? Yeah. GPU has thousands of cores. Oh, okay. You can't get them. Yeah, you can't buy a CPU like that. Um, so he has a good question. We, we and I have questions. I, I want to learn more about uh, about these things. We'll cover a little bit about GPU databases at the end of the semester. But if you're not graduating or, or you're not getting kicked out, you're not planning dropping out of CMU. Uh, <laughs> if you're coming back in the fall, I'm organizing another seminar series for databases. So this one could be entirely hardware accelerated databases. So. All the, the companies we just talked about, all, all the major database um, databases on GPUs or databases on FPGAs or databases on ASICs, they're coming in the fall, uh, and uh, we just come check it out. And if you graduate and you're leaving CMU, everything will be on YouTube. You can watch it at home in your, in your underwear, okay? All right. So now that I think I've convinced you that vectorization is a good idea, uh, that it could potentially help, and we, this is something we're interested in. So now the question is, how are we actually going to do this? Right? We're, the, we're the database developers. We, we get paid a lot of money. How do we actually build a system that, that can take advantage of SIMD? So at a high level, there's essentially three ways to do this. Um, so the, at the top, you can do automatic ve vectorization, where you just hope the CPU, the compiler does it for you. And then the second approach is provide some hints. Hopefully, it'll help figure it out. And the last one, we actually explicitly write either intrinsics or assembly to do exactly the, you know, the vectorization operations we want. I'm not, I'll go through each of these in more detail, but the way to sort of think about this is that at the very top, you, you know, there's sort of this this spectrum of how easy the 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 the, the it is to implement uh, versus how much control we're going to have out, out, out of the uh, the vectorization. So at the very top, it's easy to use because you just pass a flag to the compiler and hope it hope it gets it right. Um, but you you know the compiler is not going to be that good to find all opportunities for vectorization. So you may not have complete control. You may not get good performance. In the bottom case, if we write assembly, we can do exactly whatever we want. Um, but even if we write intrinsics, that's just as good. Uh, so we'll have complete control, but it's going to be harder to write these things. Right? And the paper you guys read from Columbia, if you looked in the appendix, the appendix is full of, of code that's full of intrinsics. So that's how they wrote it. They, they wrote, it, wrote it explicitly. And that's actually how, how we do it in our system. So let's go through each of these. So with automatic vectorization, we essentially pass a flag. Uh, to the compiler, and the, we hope that it can find loops in our code that are uh, eligible to do vectorization. And then it knows how to convert the sort of scalar code in the loop to, to be the vectorized version of this, right? Um, so this only works for really simple loops, um, and in the context of a database system, the amount of vectorization you're going to get through, this, through hoping the compiler gets it for you is actually quite low. Um, and this is because that the kind of thing, the kind of loops, the kind of things we're doing in our database system is very, very complex, and the the compiler is not going to know how to reason about it and identify here's how you know here's how to vectorize it. But even if you have simple loops, uh, even then it's still not going to be able to vectorize that because there's it has to make sure that when you vectorize code that it doesn't have unexpected side effects, right? And that's really hard to figure it out. Let's go back to the example we had before that I showed in the beginning where I wanted to add two vectors together and write it out to uh, another vector, right? So let's say I encapsulate this in a function. We take x pointers to x and y and z in as arguments, and then we just iterate to x plus y equals z. So if anybody's taking a compiler class, can you tell me whether this can be vectorized or not automatically by a compiler? He says no. Why? I mean, compiler doesn't actually know that your previous instruction, to, your, your instruction is not dependent on previous. So he says the compiler doesn't know that your the instruction, you know, it, the instruction within the loop doesn't depend on the previous instruction. Can you be more, more specific? As Z could be the same pointer as X. That's right. So the, you can't vectorize this because these pointers actually might be pointing to the same locations in memory, right? So this is not like loop unrolling where I could just have you know, copies of this 
and you know, I plus one, I plus two, I plus three, and going down, where you know, it, it, we're guaranteed not to have any side effects if we, if we execute that in sequential order. As he just said, Z might be pointing to the same memory location as X or Y. So in each iteration, the, the, the effect of the previous instruction could, could uh, one instruction could affect the next, next iteration. Right? So let's say Z is just a pointer of I's location plus one or plus 32. Uh, if we're doing, or like before for bytes. Um, in that case here, if I try to vectorize this automatically, I'm not going to get the same output, the same result as I would if I executed this in sequential order, because the, the, the SIMD thing will happen atomically, and it will not see the effect of the previous instruction. Right? So this is sort of a, 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 a byproduct of writing things in C or C++ where it, it, when you write it this way, we're describing it, we're telling the, 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 the compiler, you know, a, a sequential ordering for our instructions, but it doesn't know anything about the dependencies of these memory addresses, and therefore it can automatically vectorize this. Right? So this is a good example of why, like, if you just hope the compiler is going to figure it out, it's probably not going to figure it out. Right? Because it doesn't, doesn't know anything about, about this memory. So the way we can sort of help the compiler is to provide a hints, right? So essentially, we can provide additional information about our code and about the uh, the memory addresses that we're that we're going to operate on to know that it's possibly safe to vectorize something. So there's two approaches to do this. The first is that you essentially to provide information about the memory addresses you're dealing with that you're, you're going to use in a loop, and then the alternative is to just tell the compiler, "Hey, man, just you know, take the seatbelt off." Ignore checking for dependencies. You can vectorize anything here, All right? So the, and to do it the first way, uh, you can use this keyword in C++ called restrict. I think it's in the C99 standard, um, but it's not actually in any C++ standard. But as far as I know, every compiler, major compiler, supports this. And so what you basically do with restrict here is you're telling the compiler that the you can guarantee that these these memory locations for for these for these pointers. Are distinct; they, they don't overlap. So, therefore, you cannot have any side effects uh, in your iterations for, for your loop, right? Essentially, what, it, what restrict does is basically said for for any uh, any pointer of the same type, so you know, in star, you're guaranteeing that for all other pointers, it will not overlap, right? And so, therefore, all the loads and some stores that, that can occur on the address addresses that are pointed to by this guy here. Uh, will only go through this pointer here, and not some some other pointer, right? So, so this is one way to do it. Uh, another way is use these uh, pragmas, where you basically tell the compiler again, take you know, you ignore checking for dependencies on the vectors, and try to vectorize everything. So in this case here, you use pragma iv iv depth, meaning ignore vector dependencies, and it knows that within the for loop that occurs after it, that it shouldn't check for uh, it, should, it doesn't have to worry about any dependencies, and it can try to vectorize everything. All right? Those other pragmas are things like OpenMP or like Pragma SIMD. Um, as far as I know, they more or less do the same thing. So again, these are also uh, hints, just because we're telling the compiler that it can ignore vector dependencies. Doesn't mean it's actually going to guarantee to vector, you know, vectorize everything. All right? And the other thing is that it's it's up to us as programmers. In this case, and also with with expl explicit vectorization, that we know what we're doing, and we we can guarantee that uh, we're going to get the correct result. Uh, and, and when we when we tell the compiler to try to vectorize this code, right? And the compiler wants to be super conservative; it doesn't want to generate code that produces the wrong result. Uh, but if we start using these hints, it, it's not going to check all these things for us, right? So we could end up with a side effect that we don't actually want. And it's really important for also, since we're building a relational database system, that we produce the correct results because nobody wants to run a select query unless you're running, you're doing approximate query processing. Nobody wants to run a select query and get wrong values, right? People, people will get upset about this. Um, for machine learning, it's okay because you can, you know, the, the weights of things can go off or you do things asynchronously, and it doesn't really matter because there's no final correct result, right? Because you, you get confidence intervals. In this, we're dealing with you know hard hard values, so we need to make sure that we generate the right right value in our in our computation. So therefore, it's up to us again to be super important to make sure everything is uh, we're doing things correctly. So now the last one is with explicit vectorization. Right, again, these are using the CPU intrinsics, which I think we talked about this before when we talked about compare and swap. 
right? This is essentially a uh, syntactic sugar for the compiler to allow us to invoke explicit uh, instructions. Right? So rather than having to drop down to assembly, we can use these intrinsics that essentially look like functions, even though they're built into the compiler. So these are going to be harder to write because uh, the syntax is kind of gnarly, right? Uh, I'll show an example in the next slide, but every time I write in SIMD, I have to go look at the Intel docs because everything's always abbreviated, and you got to you know got to remember what the hell they're actually doing. Um, for simple things, it's okay. For more complex things, it gets harder and harder. Um, and then the other problem is that these are potentially not portable because Again, these are invoking explicit instructions. So if you're running, you know, if you're running on AVX 512 and you're running, you're invoking AVX 512 intrinsics. If you go try to compile on something that doesn't have AVX 512 and only has AVX 2, the compiler is going to throw an error, right? Because it's, it's not going to know how to map whatever you want to do on the newer instruction set on, on the older one, right? So we see this sometimes in our system on Jenkins. We we for her, our build farm, I think we ended up on a, on a VM that only had SE3, not SSE4. And we have SSE4, SSE4 instructions in our code, and it throws an error and throws a compiler error because it can't find those instructions, right? Because we're invoking those intrinsics. So these things are not portable. Um, actually, even furthermore, they're not going to be portable across different architectures. So if you compile for power or you compile for ARM, and you use the intrinsics for, for their SIMD instructions, it definitely will not work on... Um, on Intel's uh, in, uh, CPUs. There are some libraries that can sort of help with this, but I don't think anything is, is widely used. Yes? So like, it's portable in the level of systems? Portable, uh, you said portable in, in the level of systems? What do you mean? Uh, like, uh, different distributed version of Unix. Oh, his question is, uh, say I run on OS X, or I run on Linux, is it portable for that? Yeah, yeah, if it's the same compiler and it's the same CPU, yes. As long as it's the same CPU. The C CPU is the main thing, yes. And like you mentioned that like uh, uh, hardware support is required for the first approach, but does this uh, like stand true for every situation? This question is. Um, this question is. I said in the first thing for um, automatic vectorization, it relies on the hardware actually being able to support vectorized instructions. Yes, that's true for all of these, right? So I think in the case of um, the hints, if you use, you know, Pragma IV DEP, if, you're, if the CPU you're running on doesn't have SIMD instructions, the compiler would, should just ignore it. And I was wondering if the compiler supports, like, SIMD intrinsically, and if you see, like, simple lips where the compiler, like, sort of transforming the intrinsics. Or... So his question is, it's, it's, it's really this one here, like, like, how does the compiler actually automatically vectorize this? And your question is, does it convert it to intrinsics? Yeah. Intrinsics is, is, is just for as humans. Right? It's just a way to, for us to invoke the exact instruction. Sort of intri intris like transform to what intrinsics do. Yeah, intrinsics are just you know, math, you know, yeah, uh, synonyms for assembly. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here's an example of using uh, SAC4 uh, instructions to do uh, the same uh, vectorized addition here. So here now you see that, again, we still pass in the same uh, pointers to our vectors, but now we have to cast them into uh, the SEC4 128-bit integer vectors. Um, and then now in my, in my for loop, instead of iterating over every single element, I'm going to iterate over every four, and I can pack in the... Um, uh, this should be plus plus here. This, is actually, this actually won't work, but assume there's plus plus for these guys too. Uh, but I'm just going to iterate over uh, every, every four elements, pack them into my, uh, my, my, my uh, to invoke the, the intrinsic instruction that can do addition on these vectors, and then I can store the output of the addition into the other vector here. Right? So again, this is what I was saying before, it's all these underscore, underscore, mm store, like, it's all this, this all the intrinsics will, will look some, something like this. Right? So any questions about like how we actually want to vectorize? Again, from this point going forward, we're going to assume we're going to do uh, explicit vectorization, right? Because we need complete control over everything we're doing here. All right. So now the question is: All right. Now we know how to do how we're going to write our, our vectoriz vectorize operations. At a high level, we want to think about now how we're actually going to organize our vectorized algorithms to make use of these instructions, 
And there's two ways to do this, and this is called the direction of vectorization. So the first approach is to do horizontal vectorization, where you want to take all the elements that are within a single vector, apply some operation on them, and then produce a single, single result. Let's say I have uh, a four-lane, four-wide four, uh, four SIMD register. I want to take all these guys together and do an add on them and produce a single result. So I'm going to do 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, and I'll produce 6. Um, this kind of vectorization is only really found in the, 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 newer, the newer instructions. I think SSE 4 and AVX 2, had, 2 at least had them, but the earlier ones didn't, didn't actually support this. Uh, what is more common and what is used mostly in, or used entirely in the in the Columbia paper is to do vertical vectorization, where you're going to do uh, perform the operation across across elements at, in the same lane and produce output into a new vector here. So to do SIMD add, I'm taking zero plus one, one plus one, two plus one, three plus one. Right? I'm, I'm I'm adding uh, the items in the single lane or the, in the same lane and then producing a, a vector of the output like this. So now with the explicit vectorization, uh, we, can, we can then start building up our, our basic primitives in our system and then compose them together to do more complicated things in our algorithms that, we, that we're going to need in our database system. I said, again, this is what, what I really like about this paper because they start off with these low-level vectorized primitive operations to do like predicate evaluation and basic compression and decompression. And then they show you can how you can build from there and do, uh, do sorting and merging, which we already more or less covered in, in the last class. And then you can compose these all, all together and actually build more complex data structures like multi-way trees and bucketized hash tables to do hash joins and things like that. So the, in the paper, again, it, it, it provides these principles of how we want to develop these efficient vectorized algorithms that we're going to need to do uh, in our data system to actually process queries, right? Um, and there's two main high-level uh, uh, concepts that they're going to apply to all the algorithms that they're going to develop. The first is that they're going to favor vertical vectorization uh, by processing different input elements within, uh, within each lane and going across them rather than doing, trying to process within a single register. So going across different registers rather than going, processing a single one at a time. And then they want to try to maximize uh, the amount of useful work they're doing within these lanes by always processing, uh, processing data that produces a new result. So we'll see this uh, later on when we talk about how to do uh, hash probes. But the way to think about this is that whenever I perform an instruction uh, on, on a vector in my SIMI register and I produce output, my next instruction that I invoke should always compute something new uh, for all my lanes rather than maybe reusing some, or using the same input that I just did last time. So they'll do some extra bookkeeping to go always find new data to fill in our lanes, but that way, for every single instruction, we're always doing something useful. Again, this may not make sense at a high level now, but we'll, this may be super obvious when we see the, the hash table. So before we get to more complex things, we want to talk about the fundamental operations that they're, they're going to build upon uh, to, to allow us to do the kind of things we want to do in our database system. So they'll have selective load and store and then selective gather. So selective load, the, 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 the basic idea, this, this is a, again, this is a basic building block we need in order to do the uh, vectorized algorithms. The basic idea is that we're going to take the contents of some location in memory and write it into a vector or, or, or one of our SIMI registers. Right? So the, this vector at the top is our target, is what we want to write into. So we'll have another vector here that corresponds with a mask that tells us whether we should be actually writing something into a particular lane. So the, the mask is just a bitmap that either has 0 or 1. And if it's 0, it says, we, it says we don't want to write anything in its corresponding lane. If it's a 1, that means we do want to write something. So when we start off with, with the first guy here, 0, right? It's, again, it's 0, so we skip that for the first lane. But then when we come to 1, we want to write something. So we have a starting address. We're going to go across uh, in this direction, and every single time we want to copy something into, we copy the whatever the next element that we need. So in this case here, this is the first time we need to copy something into this. So we'll use uh, this first position here, and that gets copied into uh, into the, the lane there, right? And we do the same thing for 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 all the other ones. This next one's zero. We skip that. The next one's one. So we get the next element in memory and write that there. So in this case here, this is always can be done. Uh, 
by processing data within a single cache line. So it should be fast. Um, and this is because you can't, you know, you can't jump way far ahead to some other location of memory, right? You can only access four things. So these four elements, at, at the very most, will always appear in your, uh, in your cache. Selective store is, is essentially the reverse of this. So at the top, we have the memory location we want to write into, and then we have a bit mask event, bitmap mask again, and then we have the data that's stored in our vector. And then, again, the zero and ones correspond to whether we, we should be writing something out uh, into memory at each lane. So for the first one here, it's zero, we skip that. The next one's one, so we'll take the, uh, from the second lane here, and write it to the first position in memory. So next one's zero, skip that. And then one here, again, we take the, the fourth lane and write it into the second position in memory. All right? So as far as I can tell, this is not supported in Xeons. Uh, I looked uh, recently, I, I, I looked, looked this weekend to see whether there's, if the newer Xeons support these operations. Uh, the problem is if you Google selective store, the only two things that show up is, is well, three things show up. First is the Columbia paper, second is my slides from last year, and the third is a dude in Korea that stole my slides from last year. So as far as I can tell, this is not actually supported in, in Xeon, but they can emulate it uh, with uh, vector permutations. So this is not done, the permutations are done in SIMD, but it's not like this is a single instruction that, that can do this. Yes? Should we always specify the memory addresses in vector? Yeah, his question is, how, yeah, no, no. So his question is, how do you specify the memory address? Yeah. Like for the instruction itself, you would say, you know, here's my target vector, here's my mask vector, here's my starting address in memory. It's like the so memory is uh, consists in, in the form of a vector. You have to no, no, no. So me memory is not. Yeah. This is so this is the SIMD register. This is like DRAM or your CPU cache. Oh. So you just have a starting point, and and and, 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 and read sequentially and contiguously. Are like specifying like sort of arguments in the interest Correct. Yes. His question is the is the memory address specified as an argument? Yes. All right. The next thing we want to do is uh, uh, scatter and gather. So. The, the one thing I'll say, if, if you come from a distributed database background, scatter, scatter and gather actually means something different than what we're talking about here. In a distributed database, a scatter and gather is when you take a query, break it up into subtasks, scatter it across a bunch of nodes, and then they all process locally, and then you bring back the result and, and gather together. Right? Sort of, we sort of solved this when we did the, 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 the parallel join algorithms. But in this one, it, it's going to be something different. So at the top, again, for, for selective gather, we have our, our, our target vector, and then instead of a mask vector, we're going to have an index vector that's going to correspond to, uh, to offsets in memory that we want to write into each lane. So in this case here, for the, so we have, you know, this is our starting address zero, and it goes up you know, at, at different offsets. So these indexes correspond to the, the, the offsets in here. So for the first lane, uh, it wants to get the offset at position two, and write that content into the, the first lane here. Same one for, and for all the other ones here. And the idea here is that the memory, our, our data is stored in memory in some other form, and we want to align it to the way that we, we're going to need it in, in our vector. And this, this operation does this for us. For, us. for uh, scatter, scatter, it's the reverse of this. Again, it's taking our uh, index vector and a, uh, a value vector and it's going to tell us where, what offset we want to write into memory, right? So in this case here, the first lane uh, says I want to write my content, this is my value vector, into position 2. So 0, 1, 2 writes in there. Next one is 1, so 0, 1 goes there. So, all right, so, so is this clear what's going on here? Right? Again, it's just a different way to get data in and out of memory and our registers. Uh, but, but it, and it puts it in the form that we're, we're actually going to need. And this will be useful for us to actually build the, oper the algorithms we're going to need. Yes? So when do we need like, distributed values according to the index? This so question is, when would you actually need this? Yeah. Uh, we'll see this is some, some, some operations later on. Cool. Yeah. All right. So the issues we're going to have, though, and, and it should be upfront about, is that... Uh, the gather and scatters here are not really executed in parallel in sort of the way that I'm showing with all the lines happening at once, right? And this is because there's a fundamental limitation of L1, the CPU's L1 cache, 
where you can only really have one or two distinct accesses per cycle. So going back here, I'm showing that, um, in this case here, I want to write out four, take four different locations in memory and write them out to uh, my register. I can only do maybe at most two per cycle, right? Because that's the limitation of how, how L1 works. So from, a, from, the, from the programmer standpoint, it looks like it's a, you know, a, a single atomic operation, but underneath the covers, it actually could be across uh, multiple cycles. And of course, in the case of, of, of gather, uh, it's gather and gather, the, you may not be writing out to a single cache line. This, this, this memory address could be quite large and may not fit into a single, single cache line. Um, and then the other issue is that the gathers are only supported in the newer CPUs. I think uh, the, in the paper, they talk about the Hoswell not having this, but the Xeon Phi having this. As far as I can tell, AVX 512 actually do, does support this. So newer CPUs will actually support this. Um, and as I said before, the, the selected load and stores are not actually supported in Intel Z, uh, the, the regular Xeon CPUs, but they can get pretty a close approximation of, of it by using vector permutations. All right, so now we can go through and start building upon these to start doing a bunch of uh, uh, you know, vectorized relational operators, or re relational uh, things we need to do process relational queries. So the most common thing that people do in, in a database system is do uh, uh, vectorized predicate evaluation. Right? If any database system says that they support SIMD in, in query execution, they're probably doing this. Right? Um, and this is where you get most of the bang for the buck, right? It's very hard to actually do, you know, SIMD hash joins. It actually doesn't work out very well. Um, we already saw how to do SIMD uh, partitioning. Um, in the paper, they talk about new joins, and we saw sorting before, and then uh, balloon filters as well. So going forward, I'll show how to do uh, scans, hash tables, and partitioning, and histograms in vectorized form. So the I've already said this before, but the big limitation of, of, of the algorithms in this paper is that they assume 32-bit keys and 32-bit uh, pointers. Um, and that's because in, in 2015, they didn't have AVX 512. And then the other big thing that they assume is that the database fits entirely in your CPU cache. And that's obviously not realistic. And so by CPU cache, I mean like L3. So that's not realistic. Uh, and when you actually try to go, you know, try to execute these, these algorithms on data that exceeds the cache, SIMD doesn't help at all because the cache mismatches are what kills you. So the, we'll see this on the paper you guys read for next week. One way to overcome this is through software prefetching, which is the technique we use in our system. So you can avoid the big cache misses and pretend as if everything fits in your, in your CPU caches and do some vectorized execution by just prefetching ahead, uh, explicitly do, do explicit prefetching to go grab the data you, you're gonna need to process next so that when you finish up your current batch, the next, the next batch will already be there, and that hides this problem. But you can't do this for everything. All right, so let's how to do, look how to do selection scans. For this, I want to first show how to do a, 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 a predicate evaluation in a, in a, in a sequential scan um, with SysD, and then you'll see some, one fundamental limitation of, or one problem that will occur when we do query processing a predicate evaluation the normal way people do it, or what you normally do the first time you write a database system. And then we'll see then how to apply the, the better, the version that's better, and make it work for, for, for SIMD. So for this, we're gonna do a really simple query, which is scan a sequential scan on the entire table, no indexes, where we wanna check that our, for each key, and for every tuple, that the key is greater than or equal to a low value and less than or equal to a high value. So when you first build a database system, uh, like just like we did, the way you're probably going to implement your sequential scan is, is essentially like this. You have more or less a for loop or an iterator over every single tuple in your table. Uh, you extract the key from, from that you need to do evaluation on, and then you check, you check your predicate. Right? Is key greater than or equal to the low value or less than or equal to the high value? And if it matches, then you come down inside this if clause, and then you do the copy to put it into your output buffer and increment your output buffer offset by one so that when you come back around, you can write out the next tuple. Right? So I realize, again, we're reading code here in class, and I said that's always terrible, but you can, we kind of have to in order to understand what we're doing here. So what sucks about this? I've already said it earlier in the class. What's that? The if clause, exactly, the branch. Right? Because what would happen, right? The, if, 
as we're actually executing this, and, and assuming we're in a uh, superscalar, out of order CPU, the CPU is going to see, oh, I got this pipeline, a bunch, bunch of, uh, uh, of instructions, right? It you know, doesn't matter whether the compiler unrolls this or not, does, like it's still going to happen. And it's going to say, well, I have to make a guess about whether this if clause is going to evaluate to true. And then if I think it's be true, then I want to go ahead and preemptively do this copy and update this thing. But if I'm wrong, then I got to go back, undo this, and and then start my pipeline back over and come, you know, in, as if I'm skipping it, right? So for the extreme cases, when the predicate is either 100% selective or 0% selective, we're going to be golden, right? Because the the hardware predictor, the, the branch predictor is probably going to always get it right. It's so when things are in the middle, that's when it starts to have problems, right? If every other uh, Every other tuple we evaluate is, you know, satisfies this predicate. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna get get it wrong 50% of the time if it makes one assumption versus another, right? So this is bad because this is, we're gonna do some work here that we, we don't need. We're not actually need, and then we're gonna have to undo that, flush our instruction pipeline, and come back and, and, and start over again. So this is gonna be this is gonna suck. So we want to get rid of this if branch. So the way to do this is actually just do the copy first, right? Just do the straight copy, assume it's going to get satisfied to true. Uh, then we extract our key, then we do our evaluation, and we try to be clever about how we do our evaluation so that it's actually not an if clause. We just do a ter ternary operator that says um, if, if this thing is, is greater than this, and that can be done in single instruction, and then we just do an and between these two uh, integers together, and that's going to tell us whether we jump our offset by one or zero. So what would happen here is that we always do the copy, evaluate our, uh, our key, and then if it's true, then we go ahead and move our, our, our offset by one. If it's not true, we keep it at zero. So then we come back around and uh, just overwrite it the next time we copy. And of course, you have to have a little something outside the, the, the for loop that says, was the last thing uh, actually not, should not also be there? And make sure I, I don't include that, because otherwise the, the last one will always be included no matter what. Right, so this this thing here is essentially do the same thing as this if clause here, but there's no if if no if branch, which is what we want in a superscalar out of order execution engine, so right? A CPU. Yes. In the additional clause, to write more copies. So yeah, so as you said, the 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 we're executing more instructions, so we're doing more copies here. But as I said, depending on what the branch predictor is going to do, it might be doing that copy anyway, right? And we don't have to do that rollback in the hardware. So there's this great graph uh, from the, I think it's from a, a Vectorwise paper from a few years ago. But I've seen this graph reproduced in, uh, in other experiments, where they're comparing the, the branch list versus the branch uh, version of a sequential scan operator. And so it's kind of hard to see here, but the red line here is the no branching case, the branch list version. And as you, you expect, the, no matter what the selectivity is of the predicate, it, the, the cost is always the same because you're always doing that copy. And that's why it's essentially a straight line. In the branching case, again, at the extremes, when the selectivity is 0% or near 0%, or when the selectivity is near 100%, it performs the best because uh, it's always getting it right. The, branch, the, the CPU's branch predictor is always getting it right. But you see this huge arc in the middle here where it's actually worse. And this is when, the, again, the, 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 the hardware is mispredicting what branch is going to take. Right? If, at 50% selectivity is, is, is at the apex of this because it's getting it wrong half the time, potentially. Uh, and you end up rolling back and having to undo all the stuff. And it wouldn't have just been faster just to copy it anyway. Right? So again, this is a good example of like being aware of what the hardware we're running on and designing our algorithms as, as we build our database system to use it correctly. So now we will apply the same technique when we want to do a vectorized uh, sequential scan where we don't want to have any if clauses at all. So for this, I'm doing you know, super pseudo code uh, to sort of simplify the, the, the explanation. So instead of actually in invoking intrinsics, I have this function called simd store, or simd load, right? Like assume it's running the selector store, the, or the, or the, the, the vector, st the intrinsic store that we talked about before. Um, and then I have a subscript to say that we're operating on a vector here. So I can do essentially the same thing that I had before, where I always make a copy of, of the tuple, and then I can load in my um, 
I, I load in my, 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 my vectors of keys that I want to do a compare on, and if some portion of that, I figure out what portion of those keys evaluate to true, and I use that to figure out what offset those tuples are in, and I know that I just need to copy, uh, retain those, those in my output, and when I loop back around, I can overwrite the ones that shouldn't actually be there. So this is essentially doing the same thing at a high level that I showed in the branchless case, but it's doing all in, 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 with vectorized instructions. And we want to do this because, again, loading things in a register, now it's actually getting more expensive than just doing it on the scalar case. So again, we, 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 we're doing processing on vectors at a time. We load them in, we load our keys in, we do our evaluation, again, all vectorized as SIMD instructions, and then we use our selective store to figure out what we actually want to retain. So sort of see at a high level how this actually would work. Let's say we want to evoke that same SQL query here, right? Select start from table where key is greater than or equal to Z, uh, letter O, where key is less than the letter U. So say my, my, my database looks like this, a single table, right? And I have a, a, key, a, a integer key, or it could be the offset, or integer ID and the offset, and then the actual value is just a single character. So I load in my key vector, right, into my register. I do my SIMD compare, it generates my mask, and again, the ones tells me whether it evaluated to, to true or not based on my predicate. And then I can use this as a, as a sort of a mapping table to figure out at what offset uh, each lane corresponds to, right? And then I can use the selective SIMD store to say, all right, well, I want to take the, the, the anytime there's a one, match it up with the, what's in the value here, and that tells me in my output after my predicate, I want to retain the tuples at one, three, and four. And that corresponds to the offsets here. Right? So again, I, I, I have my, my, my table sits in memory. I load them into my, my, my target vector, my key vector. And then I have to do my CMD compare against my, my, my predicate. And that produces this mask. And then I use the selective store to figure out what offsets I want. So then I can take this as my output and know I, I, I just have to retain uh, these keys up here. Again, to me, I, I like this because it's like, it's like a puzzle. How do you take these low-level constructs of SIMD instructions and, and try to do as much processing as you can on, inside the register without bringing things back to the cache? Yes? So getting the size of VM values of the ball, would that be a horizontal add or something? Like this thing here? Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yes. His question is, how do you actually do this? I'm showing pseudocode. Yes, you have to do a, you have to add things together, yes. All right, so let's look at perform performance numbers. So again, this is running uh, in 2015 on an older version of the Xeon Phi, which did in-order execution and was not super scalar. So just be mindful of that. So the way to sort of think about this, is this is the side that is uh, in-order execution, and then this is the side with the, with the Haswell Xeon that's doing out-of-order execution. So the first result is going to be the scalar version of the, of the, the sequential scan uh, without, with branching. Um, and what you see is that the, the, as it's sort of expected, the performance sort of gets worse uh, as the selectivity uh, increases. I'm actually, what's surprising actually for this one, this one, this one looks exactly as, as you expect because it's doing in-order execution. So as you get more selective, you're doing more instructions. You, you're getting essentially copying th more things. And that's why performance goes down. In this case here, I would expect this thing to be much higher. Um, than it actually is. And then it goes down over here because I think you're, you're saturating uh, your, your memory bandwidth. And that's why it goes down. But I would, otherwise, it would be arced. When we do the scalar branchless version, so in this case here, because we're doing in-order execution, mean, this means we're always copying things uh, no matter what. Th this, as expected, this, gets, this is actually worse because, again, you're, doing, you're always doing more work. Um, in the case of the, uh, the Xeon, you, the, the, the branchless version actually gets better because, again, we're not, uh, we're not having the misprediction in our branches. And the reason why it, they essentially converge at 100% selectivity is because we're, we're, we're maxing out the memory bandwidth. Because every tuple is satisfying our predicate. We always have to write it, write it out, and we're just, we're just saturating the, the channel. For the vectorized versions, um, 
for the, the, in this case here, starting with this, this to me makes sense because uh, when you have 0% selectivity, whether you're doing early materialization or late materialization, so this means do you have to materialize the tuple immediately after the join, or you can just pass the offset uh, up into the, the query plan and assume it'll get materialized up there. Um, these are, this is not a real system. This is just like a toy, toy test bed that just, just contains the algorithms. So in the case of late materialization, they, they never actually materialize it. So when you have 0% selectivity, no tuple satisfies, so you never have to even materialize anything. So that's why they get the exact same performance. And then, of course, again, as you get down here, everybody converges at the same point because you're maximizing your, uh, your, your maxing out your, your, CP, your memory bandwidth. For this one here, I actually don't know why the late materialization for 0% selectivity would be better than the early materialization um, because it's not like the early materialization has to copy anything. So I, I don't know why this does this. But again, as you get more, more selective, it just the, you just end up doing more and more work, and then they, they converge. OK, so again, this is, this is as expected, that the branchless version would do worse because they're doing in-order execution, whereas in a uh, out-of-order execution superscalar CPU, the branchless one makes a big difference. All right, so let's talk about how to do hash tables here. All right, so for, for probing, Right, the 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 scalar way to do this is assuming you're doing a linear probing hash table. Is again, we have our input key, we hash it, that gives us a hash index, and then that jumps to some offset here, and there'll be a key at this offset, and then we, we can just do our again a, a, a scalar comparison between our key and the key that's in there to see whether we have a match, and if we don't have a match, then we just jump down to the next one and we keep scanning linearly until we either find uh, uh, the exact key that we're looking for, or we hit an empty, empty bucket, meaning we know that there's, no, there's nothing else that, that could be there. Right? So this is the way to do the scalar version, dealing one key at a time, and just do a sequential scan uh, into, into the, the hash table. So let's see how to do this in a, in a, in a uh, vectorized manner, and we'll try to do it in the horizontal vectorization, and then we'll try to do it in vertical vectorization. So to do horizontal vectorization, again, it's, it's taking a single element uh, in our input, and we want to process, uh, process it against other data items uh, at the same time. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a bucketized hash table where at each bucket, instead of having one key, we're going to have four keys. And the idea here is that we, when we do uh, our input key, we hash it and generate a hash index. When we land into a bucket, we're going to extract out the, all four keys that are in that bucket and then do our SIMD comparison against them. So in this case here, we would do a SIMD compare against all the elements inside of this, and then we'll have a, ma a mask that tells us at, 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 we have a one whether we, we have a match. Right? So the way you actually would insert something into this is that when you land into an offset, into a bucket, you just find whatever the first position that is empty and you write into there. And if they're all full, then you just jump down to the next one. Uh, so essentially it works the same thing. It's just now at a single bucket, you pack in four keys all together. So to do this uh, vertically, uh, again, the idea with the vertical vectorization is that we want to process multiple data items in our input at the same time. So for this, we're going to take our input vector of four keys and we're going to do our hashing in parallel and then produce a, a hash index vector. And then these are all going to point to different offsets in our, in our linear, linear probing hash table. So what we want to do is we extract out, uh, using SIMD gather, grab the different memory locations that we were pointed to, pack them into a uh, single input vector, single vector here, and then do a SIMD compare to produce our, our match mask. Right? So in this case here, we have key one matches with key one, so that's a one. And then these middle two guys don't match, and they're zero. And the key four matches with this, and it's one, right? Yes. Can we combine like two methods together? This question is, can we combine the two methods together? No, let's say k one, like compare it with uh, like another vector. Uh, let's let's keep going. We're short on time. I, I I don't think it's that easy. Um, all right. So at this point here, all right, the first first key and the last key matched. But we have this middle, these middle two guys here didn't match. So we need to keep processing with them, right? Because we, we have to keep scanning down until we find what we want, right? So one way to do this is that all we need to do is have for the middle two guys, 
just have them increment in, in, the, in the hash table and figure out what the next key that you need to compare against, but fix these two guys, the top one and the bottom one, to be exactly the same keys so that, because we've already found what we're looking for, so we don't need to come, you know, keep, keep looking anymore. But we said in the beginning, remember I said I wanted to maximize our, our lane utilization. This is an example of what I was talking about where as we go down, right, and we keep scanning, we're essentially wasting computation because we're comparing keys that we already know match and we're, and, and we're not getting any new, new, new information from this, right? But we have to do this because otherwise we don't, you know, otherwise we have to put some, something else here we, we actually want to scan. So what they'll do instead is, uh, instead of just recomputing on the same keys over again, they'll go back to their input vector and go grab the next items they need and fill them into uh, the, 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 the lanes of the vector that we already know match. So again, the first one and the last one already matched. So the next two keys are key five and key six, and we use them in our input vector. And then we just know that we need to go back through and uh, produce hashes and generate the next offsets we want to jump into for, for our keys. So this ensures that every single time we do a probe uh, into our hash table, we're always looking for something new, right? And not just reusing the keys that we already produced the answer for. Of course, this means we have to do some additional bookkeeping here to keep track of this. Yes? Aren't you still wasting work? Because previously you were hashing by four integers, but now you're only hashing two. So, so his, his question is, are we still wasting work? Because before, you had, before we, had, we had to hash four keys, and now in this case here, we're only ha hashing uh, two. So I, the hash actually cannot be vectorized. I should, I should be clear about this. This has to be done in parallel across cores, if you want to do that. Right or done sequentially, it's really for this part here is is vectorized. So there is there is actually one problem with this. It's a bit nuanced. I don't know if anybody can pick it up. So this makes the algorithm unstable. So what I mean by that is the the depending on what our hash table looks like, we were not we may not be executing our. Uh, we may not be evaluating keys in our input in the exact same order every single time. So, right, in this case here, right, when we, when we look at our output, say that in the first round, key one, key four match, we produce that in our output vector. And then in the next round, say key five, key two, key three, and key six all match, and they get put in our output buffer. If we executed this sequentially, we would expect the key one, key two, key three, key four. We, we expect them the output buffer would, would maintain the same order that they are evaluated in. So now if we run this on a different day, we may actually produce a different result. Now the great thing about relational, uh, relational database is that since we're unordered, right, we're using bag algebra, there is no ordering to the actual data, we don't actually care. If you really cared about the order of these things, you would add an order by clause. But that's one potential down, downside of doing this in, in a vectorized manner is that you may end up not getting the exact same result. Um, you'll still have the same content, but it may not be in the same order one day to the next. All right, so to finish up real quickly, um, we can look at the results for the, again, from the paper. Again, for, for this, you see that uh, on the Xeon Phi, it's slightly faster than the, the, the the, 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 the regular Xeon. This is because this has way, way more cores. Um, the, but you see a definite difference in performance in the vectorized versions versus the scalar version. And in the case of the, uh, the Xeon Phi, the, 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 the vertical vectorization for the probing in the hash table is much, much faster than the, the horizontal one. Um, and then the, and the, and you see the same thing for the other one. But there's this, these points here where they basically, again, converge and this is when you run out of your CPU cache. And this is what I was saying before, right? All this vectorization stuff gets thrown out the window as soon as you run out of your CPU cache, right? You're, when, you, when everything fits in CPU cache, like you're getting, you know, almost oh, 4x improvement over the scalar version of this. But when you hit the cache, everything uh, falls apart. So that's one of the main problems we're going to have to deal with. Uh, uh, we'll try to overcome in the next class. All right, I'm going to skip uh, histograms, um, which is... Just skip it. Yeah, we'll just skip it. We're out of time. Um, for joins, we'll skip this as well. Again, the only the only performance number I want to show is that uh, their vectorized version 
uh, can outperform all of the 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 the, the parallel the regular parallelized versions of, of the hash joints that we talked about before. Um, but again, this only works when everything fits in your, in your CPU cache. All right. So to finish up, uh, vectorization is super important for OLAP queries, but most of the systems that are out there that do some kind of vectorization only do it for predicate evaluation, right? Because you don't require to have everything fit in your CPU caches for this, right? You just you know grab a bunch of tuples, do your evaluation in in, in the SIMD registers, and then move it up the, the the query plan and move on to the next one. If you have to read from disk, then it, it all falls apart anyway, so it maybe it doesn't matter that much. Um, the thing we talked about in the beginning is that we can, we can combine all the intraquery parallelism that we talked about before, like how to do parallel joins um, and uh, potentially parallel logging and other things. We can, we can include SIMD stuff inside of them and then, and then multiply the, the performance benefit we can get from this, right? Because we're maximizing the performance we get on a single core and we can multiply that across all multiple cores. The paper you guys read about next week is to show that uh, you can actually do vectorization carefully in a compiled plan, um, and then the magic sauce to make this all work is the software prefetching technique um, to, to, to ensure that, again, you hide the, the, the cache miss latencies. All right, so again, next, next class, actually, next class, I'll be split into two parts. So I will teach uh, bit weaving in the beginning, um, which is an uh, idea from the University of Wisconsin, the, the quick step guys. And then Prashant will cover the, his paper that you guys are assigned to read on the, uh, in the second half, because right? I, I have to fly out. OK? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze at a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives